Um, tonight, we are thrilled to have with us again, uh, one of our favorite authors, Rick Kilby, a Gainesville native and whose family still lives here. Um, we were just talking about shark's teeth and where the best place is to find them. So um, I can, I can uh, vouch for the fact that Rick is a, um, a lover of things outdoors. Uh, in addition to that, um, he has a blog, uh, History and Culture of Florida, called Old Florida Bog, uh, Blog, <laughs> um, and he has over 900,000 views. That's pretty impressive. Um, his first book, which you may remember, is called Finding uh, the Fountain of Youth. And if you've ever been to the museum and saw the cutout where you can stick your face through the Spanish conquistador, that was thanks to Rick Kilby. Um, his new book, which I'm sure we'll hear about, is called Florida's Healing Waters. Um, and it was published last fall by the University of Florida Press. Rick's mission is to motivate Floridians like us um, to appreciate and preserve the natural wonders of our beautiful state. And we thank him for that and for being with us tonight. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Rick Gilby. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Are we ready to get started? Before we get started, I just have a few uh, logistical notes. Um, so we are live streaming this on Facebook right now. Um, and Rick will go ahead and give his presentation. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so if you're watching with us on Zoom, you can put your questions into the Q&A section of Zoom, and I will share those with Rick at the end of the presentation. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, you can put them in the comment section, and I will pay attention and share those as well at the end of the program. Um, as I've said, um, we are recording this, and it should be up on our YouTube channel, uh, probably in the next day or so. Um, and I just wanted to thank our sponsors. Um, so this program is sponsored in part by Visit Games Flatua County, Florida, and by the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida. Um, and then for those of you who did register for this through Zoom, there will be a short survey coming to you by email tomorrow. Um, so if you could answer that survey, that would be really helpful for us to get feedback on what you thought of this program and what you would like to see from us uh, in future programs. Um, so that is the end of my logistical speech. Um, so now I will turn it over to the main event. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Can everybody see my screen? I just want to make sure they see the Florida's Healing Waters logo And before I start. Thanks, Dixie. Thanks, Joanna, who does a great job with y'all's marketing. And thanks to the Matheson, because without you guys, this book might not have happened. Your collection was so invaluable in putting together my book. There's more of your pictures in this book than any other institution. Also, thanks to uh, your former director, Peggy McDonald, and thanks to Bobby, who did a lot of the scans for the book. The latest book, Florida's Heating Water, really starts with my first book, Finding the Fountain Youth, that was published in 2013. In that book, I explored the myriad ways the myth of the Fountain of Youth had been used throughout Florida's history in promoting the state, especially when it came to springs. It seemed inevitably that any spring that was developed commercially at some point would be called the Fountain of Youth. This postcard is one of my favorites from the old book, and it's White Sulphur Springs. I identified in my new book, Flores Healing Waters, about two dozen places like this where you could take the waters. And taking the waters is an ancient tradition of drinking and bathing in water from mineral springs. This image especially caught my fascination and my attention and I got a little bit obsessed because I wanted to know more. Who were these people? Why are they there? Where did they come from? Of course, if they're all invalids, in 2021, I want to know why they're not social distancing and how come there's no mass. Of course, back when I wrote the book, that wasn't an issue. But it, that's kind of why I wanted to know more because I squeezed a lot of that kind of stuff about taking the waters in the past book because it, it, I was so fascinated with that whole tradition. And I wanted to learn context about it. So I went back and 
it turns out that this bathing tradition of bathing in spring waters goes back as far as the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and it's a consistent thread throughout human history in all different cultures all across the globe. At some point in Western culture, however, the, the whole tradition almost died out entirely until the age of enlightenment when a different new tradition emerged and it was very much a part of the upper class culture to go to watering places around Europe that were had spas at them at mineral springs. Places like Spa Belgium and Evian, places we associate Perrier with drinking water began as mineral spas in Europe. Eventually that whole tradition came to North America. And in order to try and understand that tradition and how it worked in Florida, I decided to try and go to places throughout North America and the United States and, and understand it better. Some of these ancient places like Saratoga Springs in New York, and this is actually Warm Springs in Virginia. And this is this building here is called the Jefferson Pools. And Thomas Jefferson took the waters there for nine days when he, at the end of the 1700s, and the same bathhouse that he soaked in is still there today. Unfortunately, it's close to the public because it's in really bad shape and they're trying to raise enough money to stabilize it, but it's an incredible place. And this, it just goes to show you how old this tradition is in the United States and throughout the world. I also wanted to understand how that tradition worked in modern day world. So I went to Bath, England, where the water there is the same water that the ancient Romans soaked in thousands of years ago. And they have a modern spa there called Thermae Bath Spa, where they pipe up the water into this rooftop pool and you can sit there and look over the entire town. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And what really surprised me was how much it reminded me of Florida because there's people bopping around in this pool with plastic pool noodles like you're at any pool in Florida. But it's a remarkable, remarkable place, again, showing the length of this ancient tradition. There's also places in Florida where you can still take the waters where tourists go for healing and restoration. This is the Safety Harbor Spa and Resort near Clearwater. It operates as a full functioning spa. A full century and a half later after it was first discovered by soldiers who were stationed near Tampa during the Seminole Wars. This is Warm Mineral Springs near Venice. It has a devoted following of mostly Eastern Europeans who actually have moved to Florida in order to take the waters on a daily basis. And here's a contemporary shot from John Moran. I'm gonna warn you, there's a lot of wonderful John Moran pictures. I'm very blessed to allow him, that he has allowed me to use a lot of his images. And this is one of the, the few places that still has that remarkable bathing tradition. I've also gone to the places that have vestiges of what I call Florida's golden age of bathing to get a sense of the physical structures that were built for Gilded Age guests. Remnants of this era still exist if you know where to look and these are just a few of them. So I'm gonna try something new here. Before the age of COVID, when I was doing talks at places like the Matheson, I would, ask questions of the audience to try and understand how familiar they were with the topic. Thanks to the magic of technology, we're gonna try doing a poll today. So here's your first poll. Which of these former spa locations in Florida have you visited? Green Cove Springs, White Springs, also called White Sulphur Springs, Swanee Springs. Maybe you've been to all of them or maybe you've been to none of them. So if you go ahead and vote and then submit your vote, and if, sorry, you're on Facebook, you probably don't see the poll, but if you're on Zoom, you can, you can vote. And after the next slide, we'll get the results and see what everybody says. A few of these historic places are still utilized today as recreational resources by residents and tourists, many of who are completely unaware of the rich history. This small third magnitude sulfur spring feeding this swimming pool beyond it in North Florida was once the premier bathing destination in the entire state. Green Coast Springs became a must visit landing place for droves of northerners seeking a balm from the blustery winters up north. You can see where the spring is in that little red circle. The town around it was built up just for, because of the spring. And it was full of amenities geared towards providing comfort for visitors who arrived by a steamboat and later by railroad in order to take the waters. So do we have the results of the poll? Do, do, do. Wow, Green Coast Springs. Green Coast Springs is really only about an hour from Gainesville. White Springs, 
Swanee Springs, 12%, all of the above, 32%, and none of the above, 36%. That's pretty interesting. So some of you have an experience with some of these places. I think they're fascinating. Maybe you'll find them interesting. Uh, they're not some of the places I, I shared with you are very close to Gainesville. You can check them out. Okay, let's go ahead and close that window. This is a scan from the Matheson of a wonderful engraving of Magnolia Springs. And Magnolia Springs was just about a mile from Green Cove Springs. And I must admit that one of my favorite things about this book was doing the photo research. I went, spent a lot of time at the Matheson, but I also went to photo archives all over the state at tiny museums from Lake Butler and Union County to Largo and Pinellas County. And hopefully I found images that had never been published before. That was my goal. But I wanted to find a narrative of a typical visitor who came to Florida in search of heating waters in order to better tell the story. I wanted a firsthand account. And I was struggling to find what I was looking for. My book was almost done. I am a graphic designer. That's what I do for a living. This writing thing is just a, a side gig for me. And I was at one of my clients, the Orange County Regional History Center here in Orlando. And I was in the uh, collections department. And I noticed this nondescript binder on the desk of the photo archivist. And it caught my eye because it said Green Cove Springs. And I picked it up and I couldn't believe what I saw. This was original handwritten letters from 1893, all addressed to my darling Cressy. And it turns out they were written by a woman named Margaret Kyer on her trip to Florida to her daughter Cressy, who was going to college up further up north. And a lot of them were very typical. I didn't learn a whole lot in some of them because it was like you would get from your mom if you were at college. Did you get my last letter? How come you haven't written me back? Did you get the oranges we sent? You never thanked us. It's kind of like I would hear from my mom, guilt trip, guilt trip, guilt trip. But a lot of it was incredible firsthand account of visitors coming to the state in search of healing waters during the Gilded Age, giving us a glimpse into the life of the state's early medical tourists. So there's Margaret on the left, she, Margaret Kyer. She was actually Irish. Her husband on the right, Charles Kyer, he was the invalid. He was the reason they came to Florida. And he has a fascinating history. He originally came to Florida, I mean, I'm sorry, to the United States at the age of 15 as an immigrant from Germany. At the age of 22, he enlisted in the Union Army in the Civil War. When he was discharged from the Army, he set up a, a business selling liquor. And it was very successful. So a few years later, he invited one of his relatives from back in Germany to immigrate to the United States. And he set up the Kyer Brewing Company. And it was extremely successful. In fact, it was in business until the 1960s. In the 1950s, it outsold Yingling, which I'm sure you've heard about Yingling breweries still in business today. Kyer Brewery is no longer ex in existence, but it was just as successful. And Kyer had lots of money. Not only was he a big wig in the brewing business, he owned an interest in the power company, he owned his own water company, and he built one of the best equipped opera houses in the entire state of Pennsylvania. His brewery alone was worth the equivalent of $25 million. Today, this is a, his huge mansion and it's a bed and breakfast in Mahoney City, Pennsylvania, where he was from. But it, it illustrates a very important point. People coming to Florida in the Gilded Age by and large, were very wealthy. A poor person or a person of average means could not afford the trip because you had to take a steamer or take the railroad and you had to pay uh, hotels and, and all your meals. And it was, it was not for the average show. When we got automobiles, things got more democratized and people had the ability to take to the road and travel more. That's kind of when the Gilded Age or the, um, the Golden Age of bathing started to diminish because people started going places other than these spas. So Charles Kyer, the reason the Kyers came to Florida had some kind of pulmonary ailment. The History Museum in Mahoney City said they thought that he had lung cancer perhaps because he was known to be a big smoker, but I think it's just as likely he was a consumptive. A consumptive was somebody who suffered from tuberculosis and they started coming to Florida in, after the, in the early 19th century and Florida soon got a reputation as a haven for those places. It was called white death because so many consumptives never survived the disease. At one point in the 19th century, one out of four deaths was caused by tuberculosis. 
1837, John Lee Williams, who wrote a book about uh, Florida when it was in its territorial period, wrote that invalids from every part of the United States wintered in St. Augustine. So that's 1837, very early in our history. You can see this book was published in 1848. And St. Augustine was probably the first destination for invalids, and it ha soon had a reputation as a, a place where invalids could go during winter in order to restore their um, well-being. For an invalid in the 19th century, Florida was appealing for a number of reasons. Most importantly, the climate allowed one to be outside in winter. In the Victorian era, spending time outdoors in fresh air was considered an important health practice. During the Industrial Revolution, northern cities suffered from polluted air and water, and those with the means who could afford to fled to the mountains, beaches, and mineral springs to partake of the salubrious air and water. Until late in the century when germ theory was discovered, it was believed the air itself could contain miasma, basically unhealthy particles from bad air that cause disease. The belief goes way back to the ancient Greeks who believed that one's health and temperament were determined by the ratio of four humors within the body that must always be kept in balance. The four humors as stated by Hippocrates were these bodily fluids, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Sorry, I didn't tell you it was gonna get gross. Here's a little more grossness. To keep the humors in the correct ratios, extreme treatments would often be prescribed such as bloodletting and purging and leeches and patent medicine that would uh, make you, your body get rid of some of the fluids. I'll just say that. Heroic methods slowly were replaced in the 19th century and all more alternative forms of healing started to become popular, including the age old practice of taking the waters, which really never went out of popular, popularity. But that brings us to poll number two. Imagine you're living in the 19th century and these are your options. Which would you choose? Would you choose bleeding? And <laughs> just a little story, when George Washington got, was ill on his deathbed, they bled him and they basically bled him to death. That was one of the causes of his death. So I wouldn't choose that. Blistering, purging, or taking the waters, bathing in and drinking in mineral water. For me, it's a very obvious choice. Hopefully it is for you. We'll see the results of these polls in a slide or two. Go ahead and if you could um, take that down, hopefully enough people have votes because I um, this is my favorite quote. People living in Florida at the time took full advantage of the warm, healthy climate to lure ailing northerners to the state in winter. In 1887, author William Derrick Kelly documented a humorous exchange with some Florida pioneers. He was in their field and he saw their puny crops and, and he couldn't believe they could get by. And he's like, how do you survive? So the old Florida cracker says on sweet potatoes and consumptive Yankees. And, and Dara or Kelly goes, well, what do you have to sell? And he said, our atmosphere. So the whole, all the people living in Florida were kind of in on making money from these consumptive Yankees and invalids coming to our state. The entry point for most Northerners coming to Florida during this period was most often Jacksonville. The city had convenient steamship connections to New York, Charleston, and Savannah. And as early as 1865, Jacksonville Boosters wrote promotional articles that were published up north, extolling the benefits of living in what was called the Italy of America. Another reason was Union soldiers returned to the north after the Civil War, and they carried with them glowing accounts of Jacksonville's mild, clear winters. Jacksonville and Fernandina Beach in that northeast part of Florida for most of the war was under the Union Army. Um, so when they went back, they told people how great it was and they started to come down here. I love this image. You can tell, again, these are not poor people just by their clothing. They are very well appointed. And those poor guys on the right, and those are the average Joes. But these are wealthy people coming into Florida on steamboat. Visitors ride by ocean-going steamers and beginning in the 1880s by railroad and winter at dozens of hotels and boarding houses in Jacksonville. One of my favorite stats is at the top. In 1840, so we're talking about 15 years before, 15, 16 years before the Civil War, Jacksonville only had about 350 residents. But by the end of the 19th century, it was drawing more than 70,000 visitors annual. It just exploded with growth. So let's get back to the Kyers. When Charles Kyer, his doctor recommended he visit Florida in the winter of 1893, 
they started in Jacksonville. They came there from Savannah and they got there February 1st. And you can see this quote in the little tan box. Margaret says, he thought this was the only place he could go well. Oh, and I don't, not, don't know if I told you that they, um, she refers to Charles as Papa in all the letters. So Papa is, is Charles Kyer. Jacksonville was the hub of all their travels. They were in Florida three months and they went back and forth to Jacksonville. There was a doctor there that they liked. So they kept returning back to the Jacksonville because uh, Papa Kyer was pretty sick. After about a week, they traveled to St. Augustine. They went back and forth and up and down the peninsula looking for warmer temperatures and healing waters. But St. Augustine was the first place they went after Jacksonville. And on the train, Papa Kyra got sick. So they went to the very first hotel they could get to, which was the Hotel Magnolia, which was built in 1847. And it was expanded several times and then finally burned down in 1826. And I just noticed I was in St. Augustine in October. They're building a brand new hotel across from Ripley's Believe It or Not that looks just like the Hotel Magnolia. The Kyers witnessed other visitors to St. Augustine promenading on the seawall. Promenading was a social practice at spas all over the world. All the spas in Europe, that's what you did when you were there. All, all the seaside resorts in Europe, you promenaded. It was kind of like 1800 style cruising. It's an opportunity to see or be seen. It's good to be outdoors. It's considered exercise and healthy. But more than anything, it was a, a social activity more than a health giving activity. I wanna point out the round building in the background, I'm gonna talk about that a few slides from now. Uh, my wife and I started watching Birds in on Netflix. I don't know if anybody else, if I was in person, I'd say, raise your hand. But what I was fascinated by is how much time they spent promenading. And they talked, well, she's on the promenade because that's where you found a potential mate. You walked up and down and you're fancy clothes. Perhaps not this fancy. This was, this was also a little bit earlier in the 19th century, but this is promenading. And I'll point it out in slides after this. This is that round building that I talked about in the promenade shot from St. Augustine. There were no real large mineral springs. Uh, there was a couple little minor artesian springs and artesian wells around St. Augustine, but there was no big ones. So there were no places to take the, uh, the waters from at a mineral spring. So they had Capo's bathhouse and it was the perfect solution for people wanting a fix of healing waters. And it offered both hot and cold seawater baths sulfur water baths and showers. And you have to understand showers were really not about hygiene back then. It was really about hydropathy or hydrotherapy because it was believed that the water pressure hitting on your skin would release stuff in your body and get stuff moving around. So you see things like needle showers at hydrotherapeutic institutions and it, the pressure of the water is more important than getting clean. This is one of my favorite illustrations of the Capo bathhouse. It was octagonal shaped. The foundation was made out of stone, but the top was made out of wood. It was built by a former Menorcan named Philip Capo in 1870. He was in the Confederate Army. And then after the end of the war, like so many other Floridians, went to work making money from Yankees. This was ideally situated right on the seawall where the promenade was. And so it was hard to miss. But sadly, there was a huge fire in 1914 and the whole thing burned down. But I also wanna point out another thing. On the right, you can see men's bathing time and in the center image, you can see ladies and children's bathing time. And that was something that happened at Springs. The men and women were segregated by gender. Either they had different bathing times or different bathing pools. Because again, this was the Victorian era. It's an age of modesty and men and women could bathe together for the most part. After leaving St. Augustine, the Kyers visited several established mineral establishments at Mineral Springs. So the map on the right, obviously not to scale, shows the highlighted places that they visited when they were here in Florida. They went to two of the major spring-based spas, Green Coast Springs and Swanee Springs, when they were here. My book has 22 of them. So if you want to hear more, you have to get the book. <laughs> After a month, though, the Kyers visited Green Coast Springs, the most famous watering place in the state. They called it the Saratoga of the South, an homage to Sarasota Springs in New York, which was probably the most famous watering place in the United States at the time. And they stayed at a cottage in the Hotel St. Elmo. They felt isolated because, you know, the most of these hotels had cottages where if you wanted more than just a room in a hotel, you could rent the whole cottage, kind of something they still do today in some, some places, but they felt isolated as a result of that. 
The Hotel St. Elmo is interesting because it opened in 1885 as the Hotel Morganza. And then later, after it was the Hotel St. Elmo, it was associated with the sanitarium in New Jersey called Seacraft. So they rebranded it as Rivercroft and then Rivercraft. And it went through many changes. At one point, it was owned by J.C. Penney, who started Penny Farms in Clay County. And it was also the home of the Florida Military in Institute before it burned down, like all these other places do. But I also want to point out the trolley on the right is either drawn by a mule or a horse. Most of these places, that's how you got around. They would pick you up at the train station or at the steamboat landing, and that's how you moved around the town. You could go to Magnolia Springs up the road. But I'll point them out in, in some of the other springs, too. And this is Green Coast Springs, this little sulfurous third magnitude mineral spring, not only spawned a town that grew into the country county seat, but it helped to establish the industry that connected ailing northerners to the state's health giving spring waters. From the 1870s through the 1890s, the town expanded at a meteoric rate, becoming the St. John's premier destination for taking the waters. And the St. John's was really the river that developed most of the early spas, uh, you know, the ones further west developed a little bit later because they were dependent on railroads, but steamboat access made the ones on the St. John's available much earlier than the ones further west in the state. This is a photo of the spring from the opposite direction. The prior image was with the river, you know, the St. John's River at your back, looking towards the Clarendon Hotel. This is with the Clarendon Hotel looking at the river. So behind the trees in the background is the St. John's River. I want to point out a couple things. This building here by the lady with the parasol, that's a pump house and the water was pumped into the Clarendon Hotel. This is probably a bathhouse here is my guess. And then this picket fence, there, the pipe the water from the spring into pools where you would bathe. And they, um, again, had seg they were segregated by gender. This is the lobby of the Clarendon Hotel that was constructed in 1871. I'm not sure why the Kyers didn't stay there because it was the most famous hotel there. They had amenities like spring beds, hair mattresses, and electric bells, as well as a bowling alley and billiard room. Most of these places had recreational amenities in addition to the bathing because the bathing, the, the day when you really would start your day drinking the, the spring water, and then you would, you would bathe, and then you would get out and have lunch. You might bathe again in the afternoon, but much of the day was available for recreational activities. So there was always thing, other things to do. A few months after the Clarendon opened, Dr. Joseph W. Applegate purchased the hotel. He was the staff physician as well. And he would present lectures to the guests on the benefits of the spring water there. They bottled the spring water and they sent it up north. The Clarendon actually owned the rights to the spring water. And so that was another source of income for them. And bottling spring water is another thing that happens at multiple springs at these destinations. They would bottle their water and send it up north. This is an ad for the Clarendon House, and I want to point out a couple things in this. One, just the long laundry list of ailments that the, could be cured at the spring, from rheumatism to gout, and many that I can't pronounce. But the other thing I want to point out is it's called Green Cove Warm Sulfur Springs. It's 78 degrees. These people were only coming here in winter. And so, you know, it's North Florida, it gets down in the 20s and 30s, and then in the daytime, it might get up to the 60s. So the water generally is warmer than the air temperature. It's not like us who tend to go to springs in the summer when it's warmer out and they're freezing. These people are here exclusively in the winter. So to illustrate that fact, I made this little meme that I showed on Facebook today of Bernie freezing in the winter. And this is actually the bathing pool from Green Coast Springs. And you can tell this is ladies bathing time and these women are in their beautiful um, Victorian outfits and Bernie's crashing the party. So Dr. Applegate lived in a cottage right next to the Clarendon, Clarendon Hotel. The Clarendon Hotel would have been just the right of this image where those cars are. It burned down around the turn of the century. It was replaced by a, a Mediterranean revival style hotel called the Casey Sauna. But somehow this cottage survived and it's still there today. And it's a bed and breakfast and it's actually for sale. It's called the River Park Inn. And this is really the only vestige of this whole industry that, that grew up 
around this little spring in Green, Green Cove Springs. And this is all that's left, unfortunately. Some of the churches and some of the older buildings, but this is the only one directly attached to the taking the waters at the spa. On March 9th, the Kyers walked the promenade and the promenade was called St. David's Path. It went along the St. John's River up to Magnolia Springs, which is about a mile. But because Papa Kyer felt ill, they had to take a boat back. He really was not in a good way. And despite that, they loved Green Cove Springs. The letters from Margaret talked about how it was their favorite place in Florida so far, and that they thought, oh, maybe we should buy Green Cove Springs. And, you know, Kyer was wealthy, but I don't know if he was wealthy enough to buy a whole town, but that's what they said in the letter. But they went back to the doctor and the doctor said, try someplace else, try Swanee Springs. So Swanee Springs really prospered as a health resort during the railroad era. So it was a little bit later than Green Coast Springs. And it was a, called an assured cure for a variety of ailments. And they had a spring basin that was confined by rock walls. And that still stands today. It was one of the premier destinations for invalids. And what was different about it, it is that it was open all year long, where most of these other places were just winter spas and resorts. This was open year round. So, so they tried to get kind of a business from locals as well as uh, people from up north. And it, it lasted kind of into the 20th century where most of these other places kind of had gone out of business. The railroad was completed in 1861 to Live Oak. So that allowed people from both the east and west to get to Swanee Springs. But the Civil War kind of put the kibosh on further development. So it was not until 1883 that the elegant resort that the Kyer stayed in was built. And this is an image of that. The difference between Swanee Springs and Green Coast Springs is, is it was much more isolated and it was kind of a self-contained resort. A horse-drawn trolley like Green Coast Springs would deliver you from the train depot to the hotel complex. And there was a lot of things to do there from billiards to croquet. They, they bragged about having 1,200 feet of veranda. And I like to think the little stick figures and the uh, walking around are actually people promenading. The hotel advertised a perfect system of hot and cold sulfur baths brimming with the pungent water because it was piped from the spring into the hotel. Their water was famous and it was said to cure a long list of diseases from rheumatism to dyspepsia to female troubles, eczema and all blood afflictions. And its bottled form became very popular. But when the Kyers were there, again, they were staying in a little cottage apart from everybody else. They complained of boredom. For one thing, it rained the entire time, so they were probably stuck in their cottage. The other thing is they were devout Catholics, and they, they, Margaret writes in some of her letters, they ran into other Catholics. They like going to mass, they like going to church, and there were no churches at Swanee Springs. I wondered why they didn't go to White Sulphur Springs, because if you've been to White Sulphur Springs and Swanee Springs, they're really not that far apart as the crow flies. But I realized that this incredible edifice that kind of started my obsession with this topic wasn't constructed around the, till around the turn of the century. So about seven years after the Kyers visited. And this building was built by a Confederate widow, uh, widow named Minnie Moser Jackson who had a physician for a brother. And she bought it and they hired architects out of Jacksonville to build this, which I think is probably the premier spring house at any spa facility in Florida. It had four stories with a clinic, dressing rooms, and even an elevator. And uh, Minnie Moser Jackson and her brother kept it until about 1960 and they sold it and it remained in business for decades. It was torn down by the state in the 1970s. And really all that's left is the stone foundation or the, the concrete foundation at the bottom. And in that, that first level, it was rebuilt. So that the top part, if you go to White Sulphur Springs is new, it's not original. Visitors to the town of White Springs could attend the theater, go shopping, or try their hand at bowling or skating. Hunting, fishing were very popular. That was an era when a lot of sportsmen came to Florida. They shot at alligators, they shot birds, they shot anything that moved, and they took home trophy fish, and they, hopefully they ate some of the fish. And of course, in White Sulphur Springs, you could promenade. It was a very rustic promenade, but you could do it. And it was one of the premier destinations as well for people taking the waters. Another one that probably wasn't as well known was Worthington Springs. The Kyers didn't go to Worthington Springs, but I really wanted to talk about it because of its proximity to Gainesville. As you can see in this postcard, it said it's, it's famous for cures of rheumatism and indigestion and kidney troubles. This is from the Matheson. Did I, oh, sorry, I forgot to give you credit. This is one of the Matheson's wonderful postcards. 
And this is one of the Union County images that I really fell in love with. The facilities there, there were a number of hotels and they kept burning down, kept burning down. But when, be, between fires, they got a, a reputation for very excellent cuisine and great entertainment. They would bring in musical acts from Gainesville and Jacksonville and everybody went there for the 4th of July. There's all these stories in the newspaper of people taking the train there for the big 4th of July picnic and Memorial Day and all the holidays. So it was a real popular destination. I'm not sure how big of an appeal it was for invalids, but it was very popular as a recreational destination. The story of the spring was that uh, one of the early pioneers in Worthington Springs named Sam Worthington, he was there uh, before, I believe before the Second Seminole War or during the Second Seminole War, and his kids were digging around and they found water trickling out near a tree root and they dug out a little pool and that's where the spring came from. It's possible that they, it could have been an artesian well because it's not uncommon for these places to really not be springs at all, but be artesian wells. I know at Magnolia Springs, they might have initially had a spring, but the main facility was a, a well at Magnolia Springs. Unfortunately, Worthington Springs is no more. Back to the Kyers. So the Kyers, last time we left them were at Swanee Springs. They decided to head south. So they would have had to take a train uh, east to the St. John's River, take a river boat down to Sanford, get in a smaller river boat. And then they went to Hotel Indian River. The Hotel Indian River really was put on the map by President Grover Cleveland in 1888, who stayed there. And they dubbed themselves as the Tropical Health and Pleasure Resort of America. It was really kind of the frontier. Everything below, it was the edge of South Florida at that time. Now, now we consider Rockledge and Brevard County as Central Florida. But back then, that was South Florida because, you know, the, most of the interior was undeveloped. And, you know, that's where the, the Seminoles were. And Unfortunately, we didn't leave them alone and we started developing that, but that's a whole nother story. There were no mineral springs in, in Indian River country where they were staying, so they couldn't take the waters. But if they had wanted relief from water, and it's, it's likely that they would because Papa Kyer was from Baden, Germany, and Baden means bath. Baden, Baden, and all those places, those were big mineral spring spa towns. So it was in his DNA to want to take the waters. There were no springs, so their only option would have been sea bathing. And sea bathing is something I'm going to talk next, but it's time for poll three. This is a very simple one. Do you believe in the healing power of the ocean? Yes or no? I One of the stories I write about in my book was, I remember when I lived in Gainesville, uh, we played out in the woods a lot. I got poison ivy. I had crusty, nasty poison ivy all over my arm. And I was going to the beach with my aunt, who happened to be a nurse. And she said, get in that ocean water it'll help you heal. And sure enough, it did. It, uh, the salt water just sucked all the moisture out and it definitely worked. So I don't want to influence your answer though. So let's go ahead to the next slide. And um, Caitlin, if you could take that down. Bathing in seawater for medicinal purposes originated the seaside town of Scarborough on England's northeastern coast. A gentleman named Sir John Foyer published the book on the healthful benefits of seawater. Scarborough actually had a mineral spring there and there was a spa there. But for some reason, Sir John Foyer got the notion that seawater would, could be just as good for you, both bathing in and drinking salt water. They would actually drink salt water mixed with milk, which sounds like the grossest thing ever. So the sea loving cultures of the Mediterranean they reveled in recreational pursuits at the beach. But in the northern part of Europe, like England, getting into the water was not something they would intentionally do. So it was a novel idea to get into the water on purpose. So not long after this book came out, you started to see seaside resorts pop up in places like Brighton, Weymouth, Margate, Blackpool, all over England. And it was like a big fad that just took off in Belgium. They started building spas, Hall in France, they had it everywhere. So this is actually, I'm not sure which town this is, if this is Scarborough or not, but I want to point out a couple things in this image. First, the little sheds there are actually bathing machines. And again, this is the Victorian era. People are very modest. And I'm going to talk about it later. A lot of people don't know how to swim. So you would get in the bathing machine. They would roll it out into the water. You would walk down the steps. Somebody called a dipper would dip you into the water a couple of times. Then you'd go back up the steps pull you back in, you could change your clothes and not have to worry about people seeing you in your wet clothes. 
The other thing I wanted to point out is people promenading once again. It was the, the thing you did back then. So here we are back in the United States, the sea bathing fad. It was also called surf bathing. Caught on in the United States. You've heard of places like Coney Island and Atlantic City and in the Northeast. That's kind of where it started. And what I really want to point out is this rope that people are holding on to because the unwashed masses before they had indoor facilities had to bathe for hygiene in public waterways like lakes and springs and rivers and they knew how to swim. So if you were of an upper class, swimming was looked down upon because that's what the unwashed masses did. So a lot of people at the beginning of the 19th century did not know how to swim. And I believe that it took a while for it to, to catch on. About 1850, when that whole idea of being outside is good for you and exercise is good for you started to take hold, they started to look at this idea of swimming and, and it started to change in people's minds. But when this sea bathing phenomena and taking the waters in Florida, it's it, mineral springs caught on, you will see many pictures like this where people are holding on to these safety lines because they don't know how to swim. To me, it shows the commitment to getting the beneficial effects, effects of seawater because if you don't know how to swim and one of those big waves hits you, you, you could be in trouble. In the early part of the 19th century in Florida, the biggest towns were ones that had ports for sailing vessels before the age of the steamer and the steamship. So we're talking Key West, St. Augustine and Pensacola. And those were the ones that likely had the longest tradition of sea bathing. Again, John Lee Williams, who wrote the, territory, the territorial um, history of Florida, talks about sea bathing as regular habit in Pensacola among the old inhabitants as supper in the evening in 1837. But it, sea bathing in Florida really took off after the Civil War when Northerners starting venturing into the state in huge numbers by railroad. The state's coast all of a sudden started being seen as an asset suitable for investment. The elegant seaside resorts created along the Atlantic by Henry Flagler helped establish Florida as what he called the American Riviera. Of course, Flagler was John D. Rockefeller's partner in Standard Oil, and he had far more money, just like Kyer, than he would, knew what to do with, way more than Papa Kyer, though. He came to Florida the first time, though, because his consumptive wife, Mary, was told to go to Florida by her doctor. Flagler came here, he didn't like it. He went to St. Augustine, was full of invalids, he hated it. His wife, Mary, died, unfortunately, but fortunately for him, she had a real hot nurse, so he married her nurse and brought her down to St. Augustine. But this time he noticed a change had happened in St. Augustine. It was no longer full of invalids. He remarked the San Marco Hotel where he stayed had a class of society one meets at the great watering places of Europe. The people who would go to all those mineral spa, mineral spring spas and seaside resorts of Europe were now in St. Augustine and he got an idea. Well, I'm gonna build a resort in Florida equivalent to those you might see in Europe and maybe even greater and grander. So he started building things like this wonderful Hotel Ponce de Leon in 1888 and the Hotel Alcazar right across the street a couple of years afterwards. And eventually he built a chain of resorts and railroads all the way down the east coast of Florida, all the way to Key West. By the time his empire down the Atlantic coast reached Palm Beach, he was successfully luring visitors from cold northern winters to escape to the healthful beaches of Florida. His Breakers Hotel was located right on the beach. And as you can see in the image, all the little vignettes around sea bathing or surf bathing was extremely popular. And at this point was one of the main draws to come to Florida. I really believe that Palm Beach and the Breakers Hotel was the heyday of Florida sea bathing. The beach was often crowded with bathers, you can see on the left side of the picture, and people just coming out to watch the bathers. It, to me, it's interesting how some things change and some things don't. There's always gawkers at the beach who just want to watch the other people. But uh, what's really different is the safety line going across from the right to the left into the water. You won't find those at beaches anymore. As the popularity of bathing grew, Flagler began building bathing casinos and swimming pools at his resorts. Now, these were not gambling casinos. These were buildings with a bathhouse where you could change, oftentimes entertainment, and most importantly, 
swimming instructors because people are starting to decide it's important to learn how to swim. Flagler's Hotel Alcazar, however, in St. Augustine boasted the most elaborate facilities by far, including what was then advertised as the world's largest indoor swimming pool, 120 feet long by 50 feet wide, and it was fed by an artesian well. And if you go there today in the courtyards, the fountains are still fed by those same wells, and you can tell there is a lot of sulfur in there because they really still have that sulfury smell. So it's likely that this indoor pool smelled like a Florida spring, a sulfur spring. The pool was surrounded by an observation gallery and dance floors. They also had hydrotherapy facilities. This is a brochure for the Hotel Alcazar Baths, and it describes what were then state-of-the-art hydrotherapy treatments. The brochure says water could be applied as a healing agent in any form, solid, fluid, or vapor, externally or internally through treatments that included everything from traditional Russian and Turkish baths to vapor cabinets and hydrotherapeutic apparatus that directed jets of water at a patient's body. And you can see this picture right here, that cabinet on the top of it is the jets. And that was very common in hydrotherapy. Again, it hits your skin and believed it would stir things up on, on the inside of you. And hydrotherapy in the 20th century became perhaps the most popular way of taking the waters. You can still visit a portion of the Alcazar's hydrotherapy facilities in St. Augustine, if you go to the Leitner Museum, that's uh, what they called, uh, I believe, the, the Senate because everybody dressed up like they were wearing togas and it's a remarkable place. Brings us to the next poll. Have you been to Henry, any of Henry Flagler's Gilded Age properties? Have you been to the Hotel Ponce de Leon, which is Flagler College? Have you been to the Leitner Museum? which is the Hotel Alcazar. Have you been to Whitehall, which was Henry Flagler's house in Palm Beach? Today, it's the Flagler Museum. Have you been to the Breakers in Palm Beach? Now, the, there was two wooden buildings before the one that is there now, the Mediterranean Revival style one that was built in the 1920s. But of course, they burned down. And the one that's there now actually burned down after Flagler passed away. Have you been to all of them maybe? Or have you been to none of them? Cast your vote now. I'm sorry, I forgot to get the result of, of the last poll. Sorry about that. Like I said, in the early 20th century, hydrotherapy was really the most common place of taking the waters. Uh, the spas, some of them were open, but their popularity seemed to wane. And eventually surf bathing kind of morphed into recreational swimming. And the Florida Sanitarium right here in Orlando was, was initially built by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who were big believers in hydrotherapy and the power of water. Their founder had a revelation uh, at a water cure establishment in the Northeast that water should be part of their church doctrine. And so they opened the Florida Sanitarium, and today that's Advent Health, one of the largest hotel chains or hospital chains in the country. Okay, Caitlin, do we have results for this one? Let's see. Oh, I highly recommend the, going to Flagler College and taking the tour. I'm not sure if they're offering it right now during this COVID era, but it's exceptional. Hotel Alcazar, a lot of you have been to the Leitner Museum. Oh, if, you only, if you haven't been to Whitehall, if you're into Gilded Age stuff, there's no place like it in, in the breakers. All of the above, 50%. Good, we have travelers. That's cool. All right, thank you for that, Caitlin. Let's get back to the Kyers. So it's April now. And even though Swanee Springs called themselves the sanatorium, it's, they didn't really have any of the exotic hydrotherapy stuff that the Alcazar did. A number of, of spring-based spas called themselves sanitariums because that term became popular. It really started with consumption and it started in the Northeast. People started going to sanitariums to be outside and it was thought that would help the tuber tuberculosis. A lot of people mix up sanitarium and asylum. Sanitarium was really a health facility and mainly aimed at consumptives in the 19th and early 20th century. So the Kyers go back to Swanee Springs because it's the one place that Papa Kyer says helped him in the state of Florida, and which always makes me feel good because I'm often asked, did it really make a difference? Do you think there's any healing powers? For Papa Kyer, it made a difference and they went back. And this is April 21st. By May, they go back. They go back to uh, their home in Pennsylvania. But because they were so wealthy, they had the incredible, complete 19th century Florida experience. 
they took a boat to Palaka and they took the steamboat up the Akawaha River, went up the Silver River to Silver Springs, which was the Disney World of the day. It's one of those things. If you went back up north and didn't see Silver Springs, people would have said, what's wrong with you? So they were able to do that. They spent a lot of time at citrus groves, gorging themselves on citrus and sending it up to Cressy and nagging Cressy if she got it. And they went to two of the most amazing watering places in the state, Green Cove Springs and Swanee Springs. Sadly, however, Papa Kyer did not find the Fountain of Youth in Florida. And six years later, he succumbed to his ailments. The obituary said he had an attack of the grip, grip that turned into consumption, which in today's terms means he died of pulmonary complications. And he, you can see this is a picture of his funeral. He was well beloved in his hometown of Mahoney City. And this is a picture six years later after his death. And this is the Kyer family. In the back of the boat by the gondolier is Margaret Kyer, the lady who wrote all the letters. Next to her, I believe in white, is her daughter, Cressy, who was in college, to whom she wrote all the letters to while she was in college. The guy in the front of the boat is Charles Kyer's son, Charlie, also known as Champ Champagne Charlie. When Margaret inherited all of her husband's wealth, she gave it to her kids. And Charlie, being the eldest, had control over it. And being highfalutin, having expensive tastes, he soon wasted their fortune, <laughs> sadly enough, which is why they had to sell the brewery. As the practice of modern medicine in the United States became more advanced, the popularity of the po cultural tradition of taking the waters diminished. Today, most patrons of Florida Springs use them solely for recreational purposes, but it seems to me there's always been an aspect of playing in the water just for the fun of it. This is a postcard from the bathing casino at Green Cove Springs, probably around the 1920s, I would guess. And here's a picture, a recent picture of kids playing in Green Cove Springs. And I love the continuity that, that people have been using our springs for over, for centuries really, and not just for healing purposes, but for recreational uses because they love our springs. One of the rare spring bay spas that really flourished after the 20th century was Taylor County's Hampton Springs, which is near Perry. It was kind of like a country club. It was kind of like a timeshare resort and it appealed mostly to people with lots of money in Chicago and the train would bring them down to this resort. They had a spring house and a fountain, but the big draws were hunting and fishing. And you can see in the upper left, that's the bathing facilities. The uh, Hampton Springs became a well-known brand. So it was sold in pharmacies throughout the Southeast. And they really pushed the drinking water on, on you. And this brochure, it's like, make sure you take home your drinking water. And supposedly the guests would get hooked on it and they'd ask for it when they went home. This is a wonderful, wonderful image that John Moran and David Moynihan took where they lit the spring up at night. So eventually the, the resort there crumbled into the ground and was forgotten and grown over. But Taylor County around in the early 2000s cobbled together several grants and were able to do um, some archeological surveys. And they were able to find where everything was and kind of excavate it and open it up as a county park. And people started bathing in this pool again. They started swimming in and it became a beloved resource. But the county was worried about liability. They were worried somebody would crack their head open or break their back. So they did this. And this is an image from the um, what's called TACO, the Taylor County Paper. It's an acronym for TACO. And they filled it in with concrete because they were afraid they would get sued. But the residents around Taylor County were so upset that they let their county commissioners know. And so they went back and they dug it all out again. Which brings me to my point. It's my belief that Florida's waters, once seen as a vital element for luring visitors to the state, are one of its premier resources, not just for the environmental reasons, but they are historical treasures that should be preserved at all costs. The stories that Florida's watering places can help us better understand the state and this ancient tradition that we're all connected to by bathing in its springs. Do people still take the water in Florida? I get asked that all the time. One day I was driving to my car and I looked up, I was just a few miles from my house and I saw this image on a billboard and it's for a place called Indigo Float, which is an immersion pod experience where you float in magnesium sulfate, 
otherwise known as Epsom salt, which is minerals, like mineral springs. To me, this is a 21st century of taking the waters. A lot of it is about meditation and spirituality, but a, to me, that's always been a component because the origins of those places in Europe go back to the sacred spiritual traditions. And then eventually we decided that it was the minerals in the springs and not God and goddesses. But to me, people are still bathing in Florida's waters because they believe it's good for them. I want to thank the Matheson again for allowing me to do a talk with them. They have been so great to me for years now. And if you want to learn more about the topic, you can search for Florida's Healing Waters on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. It's Old FLA. And if you want to buy an autographed book, you can go to rickhilby.com. You can get them cheaper at you, my publisher, upf.com. They, I believe, are running a sale. And uh, if you send me a message, I can send you the code, would will allow you to save a few bucks on the book. And I, I, I hope you, if you've got my book already, I hope you're enjoying it. It was really a pleasure for me to put it together. And again, thank the maths and I can't get, thank them enough. So that's it. And I'd be happy to take questions. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, speaking as somebody who has Rick's book and read it, it is <laughs> Highly encourage everybody else to read it as well. Um, so you have already answered the first question, which was, how can we buy your book? Um, and then looks like we've got a couple of comments um, from Dixie. She says, I'm sure you know the Leitner Museum in St. Augustine built a promenade inside the museum overlooking the swimming pool for the same purpose, to see and be seen. That's awesome. It's so, so funny how... Ooh, things change and they don't change. <laughs> and then we have um, from Greg Young, it says, research by the Massage Therapy Institute has shown that movement of skin and deeper tissue helps to release hormones that result in systemic relaxation. This may be part of the positive effects of the healing waters. Oh, that's good. Copy that and send that to me. I, that's, that's wonderful information. I, I, I do believe... I, I do believe that there's a lot of things we don't know about water yet. I think it's a, a, an incredibly mysterious element and that it has powers we've yet to grasp. And I do believe that it can heal. And I do believe that there's an innate longing for water and to be near water. That, that's part of our DNA. Let's see. We have um, Okay, here we go. A question. Was the Indian River area the headwaters of the St. John's River? It's, let me think how yeah. far south that is. It's very close to the headwaters. Uh, I think it's a little bit further south. I think it's, um, what's it called? Blue Cypress Lake that's maybe a little bit further south than Rockledge. The place they went was in Rockledge, I think, which is a little bit North of Melbourne? Ah, oh, I get my ge geography all confused over on the space because it's it's part of the headwaters, I will say that. I think there's there's um, stuff further south that are probably considered the official headwaters, and then that's very close to part of the headwaters. And I think that's about as far south, as, you know, it, it, you would have to change to a smaller river boat in order to get there because the water was so shallow and, you know, so narrow. You couldn't take the big river boats that used to go back and forth from Sanford and Enterprise all the way up to Jacksonville. Here's another comment, uh, again from Greg. He says, great research. Thank you for your work. Oh, thank you, Greg. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Uh, Ruth Steiner says, if you go to the website of the publisher, it's um, upf.com. They already have a 30% discount if you use the code NEW21. That's a pretty good deal. And you can get my, my old book for very, very inexpensively there too, if you want it. <laughs> Let's see. Margie Esposito says, I break for Florida Springs and only grieve the fact that I live far away in Atlanta, so not easy to spend time spring hopping. And she loves your book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, You know, I want to go to um, Georgia to go to Warm Springs where FDR used to go. And 
I'd love to see the facilities there because, you know, he was a big believer in hydrotherapy and, you know, he has helped us establish that place to bring in other polio victims. And there's another spring there too, um, near Callaway Gardens, I think that looks really interesting to me. So. Let's see. Oh, I was part of the Glen Springs presentation. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Uh, what, has anybody know what's going on with Glen Springs? I, last I heard, the Elks said no, but has there been any movement on that at all? Uh, yes, Julia Kilby, you can go to Warm Springs with me. <laughs> Still on hold. That's unfortunate. Oh. Okay, so I see that somebody asked about before in 1831. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know that it wasn't really till after the Civil War we started getting numbers of people coming to Florida. You know, there were people who lived in 1831. That is so early in the state's history. You know, there was mo those were mostly people who came from South Carolina and Georgia into the state. They would have known by about the spring. So initially people just camped out. They had tents, you know, they'd get there on horseback and there's stories about them at Swanee Springs, at White Springs, at some of the other larger springs camping out around that. And, and so I think they were well known and then eventually somebody would buy it and develop it in, in order to make money. And sometimes, you know, I think they, they would just dig a well. And, you know, if, if somebody else had a well with a lot of sulfur in it, that's another thing I want to point out. It was never the big first magnitude springs like Silver Springs or Rainbow Springs. It was always these third magnitude springs that stunk. You know, one in Enterprise is Green Springs, and it's this incredible jade color. And sometimes it's uh, more sapphire color, but it's the water's all murky. And that's what they wanted because it, it indicated to them a high presence of minerals. And that's what people wanted. Um, but 1831 is really early. The first facility I know of being built is in the 1840s actually at Enterprise and it was um, Zachary Taylor's cousin Tor Cornelius Taylor who built a, a hotel at um, right at Green Springs in Volusia County. So 1831 is very early. That's incredible. Were there springs? Oh, Jane, James Rocher asked if there were springs where African Americans could take the waters. There's that one Milwaukee Springs, and I know that somebody has done research on that connected with the Matheson. I was it, not able to find much more. In that, I think they wanted to make that into a facility for African Americans after World War II to rehabilitate. Uh, and I, I believe it was off between Gainesville and Alachua off of 441. Um, but in, you know, that, that was the area of, um, well, I shouldn't say segregation because segregation was er earlier, but reconstruction for the most part. And, um, I don't know that I, I think they, these opportunities were probably not available for African-Americans, um, sadly. And, I think they they were vital in the operation. I think they relied on African American to help run these facilities, but I don't think it was open to them. I, I think um, you know one of the things you run into of hotels of that era is that um, sadly some of them um, market the fact that they all have all white help. You know that was a thing that some people desired back then. Um, but I don't know of any springs, you, you know, there is a long tradition of African-Americans using the springs for baptisms and that, you know, still goes on. But I think if they did that, I doubt they did it at any of the commercially operated springs with spas attached to them. But if they did, it probably would have been in an off time and they would have had to get the owner's permission. So that's a good question though. Very good question. Somewhere in yeah, Milwaukee Springs was near Turkey Creek. Pinkerson family. Yeah, Greg Young knows his stuff. So, oh, Vince Lamb, Frank Chapman's journal. He traveled to New York, to Gainesville and Rockledge in the late 1990s, 1990s or 1890s. He was a New York ornithologist who t sold Teddy Roosevelt, who, oh, told Roosevelt to say Pelican Island. No, I have not. I did come across an account um, in the Florida Historical Society that was similar to the Kyer ones. I, I'm taken by the Kyer account because one, I love the graphics of the letterhead. And I, you know, I've held it in my hands. It's not just something abstract that I found on the internet. 
you know, and so I feel this direct connection, you know, I can feel the ink on the paper that Margaret Kyer wrote in 1893. So for me, that's, it's very um, special to me. So Radium Springs in Albany, Georgia, but no swimming allowed. That's the, yeah, that's the one I want to visit too. Any more questions? Thanks to everybody for tuning in and thank you for the questions. I, I enjoy it a lot. I miss doing um, presentations in person, but the questions help make it feel like we're still connected. So. Yeah, um, so thank you so much to everybody who came to this presentation. Um, thank you, Rick, for taking the time out of your day. Uh, and please, Please answer the survey that's going to be coming to you by email tomorrow. Um, that's really helpful for us. And enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.